The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Literary icons, beloved but completely different. Tonight, we've got two that could hardly be more distinct. First, we consider that icon of childhood inspired by a Canadian bear, Winnie the Pooh. Then we'll hear some of the untold stories featured in a new biography of legendary troubadour, Leonard Cohen. Also, we'll get an update on how a cross-border orchestra is managing to hold a tune despite COVID-19. It's Monday, December 14th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. If we ask who is the most adored bear in the world, well, you probably know the answer. If, however, we add Canadian expat bear, you'll no doubt come up with the answer. It's Winnie the Pooh, of course. The Royal Ontario Museum opened an exhibit earlier this year featuring the ursine character created by A.A. A. Milne. And while it's under lockdown with the rest of the provincial capital right now, there's still lots to talk about and to see online. With us to get that started, we welcome Lindsay Maddock, the great granddaughter of Captain Harry Colburn, who's the Canadian veterinarian who once donated a bear cub named Winnie to the London Zoo. She's the author of Finding Winnie and co-author of Winnie's Great War. And we welcome Justin Jennings. He's the archaeologist and senior curator in the Royal Ontario Museum's Department of Art and Culture. And it's a great pleasure to have you two here with us tonight on TVO to talk about something well, it's not often we talk about something that everybody knows, but I think this is one of those occasions where we're going to talk about something that everybody knows. Lindsay, your family's ties go uh, way back with Winnie the Pooh. It was, it was more than 100 years ago, right? August 24th, 1914, your great-grandfather wrote in his diary, left Port Arthur, 7 a.m., on train, bought bear, $20. <laughs> What's the backstory to all of that? <laughs> he did write that uh, over 100 years ago. So he, my great-grandfather was a veterinarian when the first, he lived in Winnipeg, and when the First World War broke out, he enlisted with a Winnipeg regiment, uh, got on the train, traveled through White River, Ontario, got off, met a hunter. He was selling a bear cub. He bought it for $20 as a mascot for his regiment, named it Winnie, uh, short for Winnipeg to sort of remind his, I think, fellow soldiers of where, of their hometown, got back on the train and then basically tra trained Winnie, uh, traveled across the Atlantic, trained, uh, sorry, tra trained in Quebec at Valcartier, got, traveled across the Atlantic, trained in Salisbury Plain, and then about four months later when he realized they had to go to the front lines and it was not going to be safe for a little bear, uh, he needed to find a new home, and the London Zoo was that new home. And, of course, she had some very famous visitors uh, that came along the way, um, which ended up um, resulting in uh, the story that we all talk about now today, Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I suspect a lot of people know that Winnie the Pooh was named after Winnipeg, but I didn't know it was after the regiment that your great-grandfather served in. That was the real connection to Winnipeg? So his he was from Winnipeg. He was he immigrated from from uh, from England, but lived in Winnipeg. And so when he uh, when he named her, he chose the name Winnipeg after his hometown. But his his regiment was a four, was the Fort Erie Horse, which was a Winnipeg based regiment. Gotcha. How did maybe Justin, you can pick up the story because because uh, Lindsay just told us that the bear eventually ended up at the London Zoo. But uh, fill in some of the blanks there. How did that happen? Well. You know, it's a weird thing because a lot of a lot of people say, "Well, why would you possibly pick up a bear on the on your way to war?" Um, but mascots are pretty common, so when um, Harry Colburn and his and his regiment stopped there, they picked up the bear. They went all the way, as uh, Lindsay said, across the Atlantic, Salisbury Plain. We're doing all of their uh, training there, and of course, he was faced with going into the trenches of World War One. You weren't allowed to bring in bring the bring the mascots into the into the war front. Most people. Uh, followed that, and actually a lot of uh, animals got donated to places like Toronto Zoo. I think there were five black bears donated during the war. So it wasn't just Winnie that went into the zoo. Lots of animals ended up sort of stopping England on their way to World War I, um, although a few people did smuggle uh, animals into the front, and 
There's famous stories, for example, you may know of Sergeant Billy, right, the World War I uh, goat that actually uh, saved three Canadian soldiers by pushing them into the trenches just as a, a bomb was about to explode. But for the most part, uh, animals that got all the way to England like Winnie were left at the zoo uh, for the duration of the war for their safety. And Lindsay, did it never occur to your great grandfather that this cute and cuddly little bear would someday grow up into presumably a very big and potentially nasty bear and he might not want to be around it? <laughs> you know, that's something that I've, I've thought about. My eight-year-old son likes specifically to ask me that question because as we all know, bears are wild animals and no matter how well you train them, there's a distinct possibility that it's, you know, it's true nature is going to come out. But I like to think that, you know, she did have a unique nature. Harry was, of course, a veterinarian. He was going overseas to look after the cavalry, so the horses. Um, and I like to think that he had a, a way with animals. And certainly Winnie had a particularly unique nature. The London Zoo, there was a zookeeper, Ernest Scales, at the London Zoo who wrote that Winnie was the only bear they ever trusted entirely, which I always thought was sort of a funny fact because I don't know if that implies they, they trusted the other bears, you know, partially. <laughs> um, but they never had an incident. She lived for 20 years, which is a very long time at the London Zoo. Um, and she was, you know, beloved by, by children uh, at the zoo. Well, she was beloved by children at the zoo and, of course, beloved by children and families outside the zoo. Once, once the story of Winnie became popularized by A.A. A. Milne, Alan Alexander Milne, and his son, Christopher. Justin, can you pick up the story there and tell us when did they come into the picture and, and therefore popularize this little bear? Yeah, sure. So that the uh, Chris Rum was born in 1920, about a year after he picks up that bear you saw in that picture. He called him Edward Bear or just Bear. And, but a few years later, he started going a lot to the London Zoo. As Lindsay was saying, that Winnie was already a crowd favorite there. Uh, it was a bear, was a cute, cuddly bear. The bear loved kids. The, the bear loved treats. Um, the, the, actually, uh, A.M. was able to get his son in, and you'll see some famous pictures of, uh, of Christopher Robin sitting there inside the cage feeding uh, Winnie treats like condensed milk. So there was this very strong attachment. His attachment was so strong that a few years after getting that bear, he decided to change the name Chris Robin from Edward Bear to to Winnie or Winnie the Pooh, and that part of the Pooh part comes from a swan that he knew. Winnie comes from the uh, comes from the bear, and of course you got to get into the mind of a four year old in, in order to understand why he chose that uh, that name. But he chose that name; it stuck. And then his father began to write stories to entertain his. Uh, his son and those stories and stories that we we see in the Winnie the Pooh uh, books. Okay, hit me with that again. I might have missed something there. The Pooh part sure. came from where? The Pooh. So he would. Well, there's a lot of stories here, you know. So first of all, the whole idea is probably the the the, the Winnie the Pooh thing is almost like uh, Alexander the Great. So it's sort of Winnie is the bear part. The is sort of uh, you know like an Alexander the Great kind of idea, and then Pooh was what he would call a swan that he would uh, feed in the lake in London. So it was the poo swan. So once again, you've got to get into the head of a four-year-old and say, okay, how do four-year-olds think? He added all these together and came up with Winnie the Pooh. His father loved it. The name stuck. And then the books came out of uh, Chris Robin's imagination. All the other uh, stuffies that he had in his nursery and all the adventures that he would have in the woods in their cottage that they bought a few years after he was born. Gotcha. Lindsay, do you know whether your great-grandfather ever met A.A. A. Milne? He did not. So when the war ended, he I think he spent about a year in England, uh, in London, after the war, and then he moved back to Canada, um, and he never he never returned to England. So And he, he passed away in about 1947. So... Um, he never had a chance to um, to meet Milne, and it's it's a little bit difficult. That's the one piece of the story I think that's been hard for me as I've sort of pursued my family history to understand is how much awareness he had of the popularity of the Winnie the Pooh stories. Um, we know that he certainly knew they existed, but it was such a different time, uh, and it's it's been sort of hard for me to get a full picture of exactly how much he understood just how you know popular the stories uh, became. Oh, that was going to be my follow-up. Do you know whether he liked the books or was aware of the books or had read any of the books? I knew, I know from my grandfather who, who passed away when I was, was younger, but from the conversations I had, he certainly 
Um, he knew of the books. Um, he enjoyed them, but it, it, it's a, it's a strange sort of missing piece of the story where you, you would, you would think there would have sort of felt like there was a bigger, um, attention to it. And even honestly with my grandfather, um, the story was not well celebrated and well recognized in terms of a Canadian connection until well into the late eighties. Um, and that really came about almost by accident. There was an article that came out um, that my grandfather um, was alerted to in the Calgary Herald saying that the bear had actually belonged to an Edmonton-based regiment. And he, of course, had all the diaries, all the photographs, and said, no, no, this was a, 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 a Winnipeg-based regiment, and it was my grandfather, you know, my father's bear. Uh, it was named after Winnipeg. And so at that point in the 80s, the story sort of really blew up, and the, the, the origins of it were really celebrated. But as to exactly Harry's um, kind of full appreciation, it's it's a little bit of a mystery still. Gotcha. Justin, how about Christopher Robin? How did he feel about the books? Well, he had mixed feelings about the books. You can imagine that as growing up, you know, the, the, the lead story is, you know, this little six-year-old running around named Christopher Robin. So, you know, he got bullied a little bit as he was growing up. He was always trying to sort of... Uh, get away from that name in some ways. Although, you know, at the same time, this was such a precious and important part of his his life that he looked back at it in fond memory. So he had a lot of mixed feelings about it. I think, you know, he never really, um, you know, he didn't he didn't embrace the fame. He ended up as a, as a bookseller. He wasn't all that excited about, you know, people going up and wanting to talk to him about Winnie the Pooh and trying to get his autograph and things like that. But he still had, certainly had a sweet spot for the bear and a sweet spot for his father. Um, and the stories, of, you know, but but it was it was tough because you know he was living in the shadow of this little this little tiny boy for the whole rest of his life. Gotcha, um, Justin. I want to ask you about the exhibit. You know, Winnie the Pooh exploring a classic, uh, which is at the Royal Ontario Museum. But I guess we should point out that this started overseas first. It was at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London first, and and I'm going to guess that they probably did not hone in on the Canadian angle of this story as much as you are. So how important was it for you guys at the ROM to make sure the Canadian angle was more front and center? Yeah, the Victor and Albert Museum, you know, they did an incredible job, but they were focused mainly on this idea, the story starts in London and then blows up from there. And there was one little tiny picture in the whole show that showed Christopher Robin Winnie at the London Zoo. And we said, well, hold on a second, you know, for our Canadian audience, and I remember as we were talking about doing this show, I would be routinely have someone come up to me and start telling me the Winnipeg story, you know, Winnie and the and the bear and everything, and getting very excited about about the show and making sure that I would talk about uh, Winnie uh, and, and that, that we'd have that as a big part of our show. So we rearranged the show in part in collaboration with Victoria and Albert so that we began the story not in 1920 London, but in 1914 when uh, Harry Colborn stops in the White River and picks up Winnie. So we really tried to emphasize that story for our visitors because, yeah, as Canadians, we feel that we have a big stake in the Winnie the Pooh story and wanted to tell that, that part of the story. Lindsay, you have written two books, Finding Winnie and Winnie's Great War. So, uh, I mean, I guess it's pretty obvious that you care a great deal about your family's unique role in the Winnie the Pooh story. Um, why has it captivated you so much? So I've been, I sort of always think of this story as um, this it's a little bit of a magical story. Like if it didn't belong to my family, it would be the kind of story I would be captivated with no matter who it was connected to, because I've always loved stories ever since I was a child. And I think that every so often when you hear a true story, um, that is kind of as remarkable as a fictional story, it, it really resonates. And so I think ever since I've been a little kid, I was really captivated with the story. I remember my grandfather, showing me the diary that you you know mentioned at the beginning where of course Harry made a notation about buying Winnie and I just found it kind of kind of remarkable and so along the way you know I did different things as a kid to sort of explore it and I had a lot of questions and I had this idea before my book Finding Winnie that one day I would have children myself and at that point I didn't have any kids and that it would be a really amazing way to explain the story to my kids as a picture book. And so that was sort of the idea behind Finding Winnie. My son was um, only about a year old when the book came out. So it was a little bit lost on him. I now have a daughter who is three. And she actually 
um, it's been kind of amazing to sort of actually, because with my son, he was too young in a way, but with my daughter, she really is understanding this family history through the book where she went to the ROM and she literally walked around and said, there's my great, great grandfather. <laughs> and, uh, it was sort of a moment of, um, you know, a kind of a real dream coming true. So me. it will be important for you for the next generation down to take as much pride in this as you clearly have. Yes. Absolutely. I've been planting those seeds already <laughs> with my kids <laughs> that one of them needs to pick up the torch here. So. And, and has, I mean, you're three generations removed from the, you know, origin of this story. Has, has your grandfather's generation and your parents' generation been as captivated by this as you have been? So I would say my grandfather, uh, so Harry's only son, Fred, uh, Fred played a really pretty unique role in, um, the story because he was a person who loved to do research. Um, he, he really, I sort of, I often think of myself as sort of the 2.0 of telling the story because Fred did so much work in terms of, you know, making sure that the Canadian story was of course known, getting the statues built to commemorate the story in both, uh, Winnipeg and the London zoo. There was a heritage minute, there was a Canada post stamp. So there was all these sort of foundational pieces that celebrated the story in Canada. And I feel like while m most people, most Canadians know this story, when at the time that Finding Winnie came out and certainly Winnie's Great War, it's been really interesting to me to travel literally around the world at this point and share the story globally and to have people go, wow, there's a Canadian connection to this story. So um, I think that, you know, it's it's very important to um, to share it. And I think that, you know, my, my mom and my, and her sisters, I think definitely, um, loved the story, but I just think that, you know, my grandfather had a specific sort of skill set, and I loved to write. So, um, I sort of took it in my own, um, way to, to celebrate it. Hmm. Justin, it seems impossible today to have a conversation without bringing COVID-19 into it. So we're going to do that now. What's COVID done to your exhibition? Uh, well, I mean, it's been uh, been heartbreaking, like a lot of things. We opened the the show. Uh, I think it was March thirteenth. Uh, within a week, of course, we were shut down for the first time, and then uh, we worked hard, like a lot of um, other businesses worked hard in order to to do what, everything we could within the guidelines to get it all set up. We had a nice uh, uh, rerun. The Victorian Albert was kind enough to to let us extend the show, so we opened it up for a little bit longer. And of course, uh, as you said in the opening we had to shut down again. So we're optimistic that we'll be able to catch the last bit of it. We're going to close January 17th. And we're hoping we'll be able to get a few more people to see the, uh, to, to go through the 100 acre wood and enjoy Winnie the Pooh. But uh, yeah, it's been difficult. It's been a difficult time for the museum community in general. And for sure, January is it? You can't get it extended? No, we can't get it extended. It's got to go. And we were the very last stop. It was sort of a poetic thing where we thought that, the, you know, the Canadian, uh, that Winnie the Pooh began in Canada, we were going to end the show in Canada. I was supposed to end, I believe it was in August. They were kind enough to let us extend it by about six months. But, yeah, that's the end. So, unfortunately, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, if we can't open, we can't open. But, um, you know, we'll try to do what we can online and, and get people excited about the books again because it is quite, quite a magical read. I mean, a lot of people know uh, Winnie the Pooh from Disney, but it's, it's quite incredible just to look at the original uh, Milne and Shepherd stories from uh, – from the 1920s. Well, Lindsay, I guess if you can't get to the Royal Ontario Museum, you can always go to Northern Ontario to White River where they they kind of do a poo fest every year, don't they? They do. I, I personally haven't actually been to it, but I've been to the town of White River and I've heard a lot of stories about the festival and uh, it's it's amazing when you go through that town. It's, it's, it's quite small, but they have really done a, an amazing job in terms of celebrating the connection to to Winnie and I've heard the festival is a lot of fun and they had to do it virtually this year I guess like everything else right I would imagine so yeah yeah they did Justin I gather there are Winnie the Pooh groupies out there do you know any and what are they like oh sure I mean there's lots of folks that it's amazing we open the show of course there's there's lots of people from kids to uh to adults that are in their uh, Winnie the Pooh costumes or their Eeyore costumes walking through so it Felt a little bit like Comic Con on occasion, uh, you know, as, as you had at least uh, some people really getting into the spirit. And uh, you know, I've gotten lots of emails and and uh, you know, phone calls where people have pulled me aside, and and it's it's really quite touching because they'll talk about how 
you know, growing up that uh, how Winnie the Pooh changed their lives. Sometimes it's kids, sometimes it's adults. I mean, so there's lots of people that feel really, really passionately about Pooh and are so thankful for those stories and so, so thankful for the exhibit uh, just to bring a little bit of sunshine into their lives during uh, these dark COVID days. I think, Lindsay, we really do have to hit on the head here why this thing is so popular and has been for so many years. Because after all, this is a story about a bear, which is, um, well, <laughs> Winnie the Pooh is very naive and very calm and very sweet. Um, the piglet is pretty neurotic. The tigger is pretty hyper. Eeyore is always very depressed. Uh, the rabbit is always very grumpy. What is it about this combination of characters that seems to have just caught on so hard over the years? Well, I think that having now had young children myself, there's there's just sort of an honesty in all those characters in the way they are. And I think there's something really universal about them. Most of us can, on some level, we all have an Eeyore. We all have a Piglet. Um, we all have a Pooh in our lives who you just, there's there's a, a, a really sort of natural quality to, I think, the way um, Milne was able to bring those personality types to life, those contrasting personality types in a way that's really true and authentic. And I think there's something about little kids that they really, they tell you the straight goods. Kids, they don't filter things. They, uh, and I think that there's, there's just a, a, an honesty in those characters that, that resonates. I think that the stories are at the end of the day, they're about friendship. They're about adventure. Um, they're about things that they're about imagining. And so I think that there's, you know, when you when you watch a child sort of take in the adventures that they had on, there's a simplicity to them that I think really, really resonates. And, and one of the things I would add to that, that that I found just really interesting personally that I didn't know and that the exhibition kind of uh, enlightened me to is that um, when E.H. Shepard drew those characters um, and he was drawing them based on, of course, Christopher Robin's stuffed animals, and so the way the physicality of the stuffed animals looked, so a sort of a piglet had this kind of, as a stuffed animal, had this kind of constant look of surprise and Eeyore looked sort of downtrodden. And so it was the, the sort of these worn, loved children stuffed animals that ended up creating these physical, the look of the animals ended up informing the personalities of the characters. And I thought that was just really fascinating um, as well. Justin, what would you add to that? Why do you think it works? Well, I mean, I think it works just because, as you said, it's that, as she said, it's that great honesty, the great sense of, hey, look, you know, um, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel grumpy. It's okay to have these big feelings that are overwhelming. And it's okay to, to reach out to other people. I mean, I, I, um, we, we get the honor of when we do these shows, I have a little curatorial statement at the beginning. And I, I um, quoted in mind the end of uh, the House of Pooh Corner that if anyone's read the end of that book, you, you can't help crying. It's, uh, you know, Chris Robbins saying goodbye to Hunter Edgar Wood. He reaches up, uh, he reaches down his hand. Winnie the Pooh uh, reaches reaches up his paw, and they sort of hold on to each other and just hold on for dear life because they know that moment's over. You know, of, of childhood. So there is just these these incredible uh, uh, things that you see in those books. That's amazing. That when you read them, you know, when you're a kid, you read them now as an adult. You read them when you have grandkids. It's always different. It really, just strikes you because that. Those emotions are so raw and so real. So that's why I think it just has that that power across, you know, more than a century now. Uh, well, I should say, well, the, the, the books are a little bit less than a century, but almost a century now. Um, it, it just works because it, it gets right at, at those human feelings. Full confession time, Justin. Which character do you identify with the most? Oh, I mean, it depends. Uh, it depends on the on where I am right now. Sometimes, uh, you know, Piglet. I'm a little little bit terrified, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, so I think that uh, you know, sometimes I'm an ER. You know, it just depends as as I go along. And I'll, you know, sometimes I have that false confidence. So, uh, I, I, always I think what you do is you look at all those different characters and you say, okay, what am I right now? It's okay to be that right now. And then you try to sort of maybe push yourself away from that cliff about doing, being too Eeyore, being too Piglet, or too, being too Rabbit, or what happened. Lindsay, you don't get off the hook from this question either. Which one do you, <laughs> which one do you identify with the most? I think my friends would say I'm a bit Tigger-like. I'm sort of bouncing around all the time, but I, I think on some level, I'm constantly trying to be, to find my inner poo, and, uh, you know, just kind of be a little more zen and present and, and all those wonderful things that the poo is. But uh, the truth is I'm, I'm a bit Tigger. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all need a bit more Winnie the Pooh in us these days, don't we? Given the times in which we live, it would be good to be a little bit more 
chill with the world, right? Fair to say? It's totally fair to say. <laughs> yeah. uh, how about this? We've got a few minutes left here, and I wouldn't mind getting into some, I don't know, call them what you will, fun facts or th things about Winnie the Pooh that maybe people don't know but you want to lay on us now. Justin, you want to start? Well, I, I think the, the, the biggest fun fact, and uh, thanks for calling on me first, so then it becomes a little easier for me, but the, the, first, the first fun fact, of course, is that Winnie was a girl, right? So one of the big things that... Uh, that people like to talk about is, you know, Winnie was a, a uh, you know, a female bear. Uh, and then for whatever reason, it's never quite clear, um, but that uh, Winnie the Pooh becomes a boy bear by the time that, uh, that it's written about. So that's one fun fact for you. Great. Lindsay, that's going to be a tough one to match, but I bet you can do it. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, the one fun fact I would add, when Justin was talking earlier about how uh, Winnie the Pooh got its, uh, became Winnie the Pooh, and we know the Winnie part, we know the the part, and the Pooh was the, was the swan, but the, the reason that I've heard is because the, fa the swan would shed its feathers, and when the feathers would land on Christopher Robin's sleeve, the sound he would make to, he would blow off the feathers from his sleeve, and the sound that would, it would come out was poo, poo, uh, blowing the feathers out. So that's mm. the way I've heard the Pooh part coming into play, which is kind of fun. That is cool. And that, of course, makes perfect sense. Well, I want to thank both of you for coming on a TVO tonight and telling us all about this. Justin, our fingers are really, fingers and toes crossed that we get those doors to the ROM open at some point so that we can all see this exhibit. And Lindsay Maddock, it's so good of you not only to write the books and keep the legacy going, but to join us here tonight and share all of your great wisdom. Lindsay Maddock, Justin Jennings, thanks so much to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Last year, when people moved freely across the Canada-U.S. border and gathered in concert halls to listen to music, we visited a most remarkable cross-border orchestra to find out how they made it all work. Have a look. For over 60 years, the International Symphony Orchestra has been making music. Music that can be heard on both sides of the border. That's because the community orchestra plays both in Sarnia, Ontario, and its neighbor to the west, Port Huron, Michigan. There were two small orchestra ensembles in 1958 uh, on both sides, and it was felt that uh, perhaps they could make a go of it and uh, you know survive uh, if they teamed up. Since the Little Orchestra Society of Sarnia and the Port Huron String Ensemble entered its partnership, they've grown from two concerts a year to a full season, which includes shows on both the Canadian and American side. And it's only one of a handful of cross-border symphonies in the province. Since COVID has thrown everything up in the air, we thought we'd find out how they're doing. Anthony Wing is the executive director of the International Symphony Orchestra, and he joins us now from Sarnia, Ontario, for an update. Welcome to the show, sir. Uh, thanks, Jan. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on today. So, you know, it's been since March that the border has been closed. Tell us about the impact that has had on the orchestra. For the basic uh, admin side, uh, you know, I have not been able to visit our office in in New Michigan uh, since about the second week of March. Um, so the um, uh, so the uh, adjustment. Uh, um, was immediate and uh, we had to address it to, you know straight away so uh, the, uh conducting all the business by telephone zoom mm -hmm. skype uh, as we are here uh it became a, a thing and even more of a pressing uh, emergent issue uh when of course we had to lay off staff so uh since uh, since may it's just been um it's just been me and uh the bookkeeper here in uh, on the on the canadian side i'm curious you know as a, as a as a you know as an orchestra, you guys are performing on stage regularly. Uh, summers are usually a busy month. How have you been able to stay relevant for the past nine months? Well, we had to come up with some um, uh, we had to come up with some projects to keep uh, to keep some light on us. Uh, we had, we had already undergone um, a, bit, a bit of a renewal, a bit of a rebrand. Uh, we had opened up a performance center and art gallery uh, down downtown on the on the Canadian side, and we were developing things in uh, in Michigan. And uh, so this had to this had to be somehow uh, continued. We had to find a way to sustain it. So what we did in the summertime was we did a we did a window series. We put musicians inside the front window, 
of uh, the ISOBAR, which is our headquarters in Sarnia. Uh, and we just ran a cord out to a speaker on the sidewalk uh, and um, because it was concurrent with, uh, a, with a shutdown of the downtown core for weekends uh, to encourage support of um, small business during, um, during COVID. So uh, we would have Saturday afternoon con- concerts, uh, the, the window dis- the distanced. And uh, this went on for 10 weeks and essentially became a rent party for us. Huh. And we were able to uh, prepare uh, to try to usher in an online uh, series because of it. Now, that seems like a great idea, obviously, in the summer as well, as we get into the colder months. I'm curious, um, you have a new sh- a series coming out uh, later this month. Tell us about that. Well, it's called the Nexus Chamber Series. Um, it's, um, uh, it is, uh, in a way, it is, a, it is a continuance of our, um, uh, of our uh, overarching plan to um, become more of a, a regional content provider for uh, for music, youth education, and uh, art, and uh, and uh, and a culture. So, we are filming. Uh, empty hall concerts, both on the Canadian and the Michigan side. Uh, and then it's all edited together and it's offered on a line. There will be five episodes. The first one uh, will be the Christmas special, um, uh, which will um, which will drop on uh, 21st of uh, December. It seems like if there's one silver lining, um you know, for the orchestra during this pandemic is that you kind of discovered a whole new uh, donor base. Uh, tell us about that. That's right. We did a... Um, uh, we just looked at uh, how um, larger orchestras uh, across the continent uh, have been adjusting to it. And uh, the ones that have been doing the the most good or, or like doing the best to sustain themselves and, you know, get their content on uh, line were the ones that were the most community supported. Um, so we uh, so we first came out with a drive in the spring where we where we reached out to people with no history. Uh, and groups and 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 uh, uh, and businesses with with no previous his, uh, history of uh, symphony support. So the appeal was to uh, to be interested not in season tickets or 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 or, or an online content, but to keep this regional um, media or 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 organization going until we are able to reunite our uh, members. Anthony, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show tonight, and I wish you the best on your shows later this month. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, Jan. And if I can say, uh, uh, you know, if anyone is interested uh, in like the online um, uh, series, just you know, send us an email to tickets at the ISO.org. The accolades and adoration that flowed across the globe after the death of Canadian icon Leonard Cohen four years ago reflect his enormous influence even well beyond the realms of music, poetry and literature. But as he was starting out, that outcome was far from obvious. And as the first of a planned three-volume chronicle of his extraordinary life suggests, he wasn't always the easiest person to love. Writer and journalist Michael Posner is the ambitious author of that forthcoming trilogy. The first installment is called Leonard Cohen, Untold Stories, The Early Years. And Michael Posner joins us now on the line from Ontario's capital city. Michael, it's good to see you again. How are you managing? I'm managing. Nice to see you. Okay, glad to hear that. Can we just get terms clarified off the top here? Because um, it's interesting. I was showing your book to somebody the other day and mentioned that it was an oral biography, and they weren't familiar with the term. And uh, maybe I should just give you a moment here to explain how that's different from, say, a regular bio that somebody might read about a famous person. Well, succinctly, it's, it's essentially the voices or the edited interviews of the 500-plus people that I've interviewed, um, and I string them together uh, in a, what I hope is a coherent fashion and try to tell Leonard's story, birth to death, chronologically, uh, as best I can. And, and it, the oral biography takes the writer out of the equation, essentially. Instead of my top-down interpret- interpretation of Leonard, you get to hear from the people who actually knew him. And so I, I think it has certain advantages and certain disadvantages, but, but I think it worked for Leonard. Well, having said that, you do point out in the book that you can't 100% vouch for all the stories that are in here because, after all, these are the early years. You're relying on people's memories from several decades ago, right? 
Absolutely. Memories are fallible. Um, and sometimes you have to use a, a kind of editorial triangulation. You know, you somebody remembers a certain incident that occurred at a certain time, and maybe you try and find somebody else who might have been at that event and, and see if their memory jibes and, and you try to, to get things in alignment. But but indeed, it isn't it isn't foolproof by any stretch of the imagination. Now, you've been at this for a long time because you do say in the book that you approached Leonard Cohen, I think back in 2007, with the idea of doing this. What was his reaction at the time? His reaction at the time was very positive or somewhat positive. He was in the middle of litigation with his former personal manager. Uh, and it was not a propitious time for him to engage in such an enterprise. So he kind of gently let me down. He said, it's an interesting idea. Maybe we can discuss it later. Words to that effect. And and then I was busy at the Globe and Mail at the time, and he subsequently bent, went back, as you know, on the road for five years uh, to enormous acclaim around the world in concert tours. And I didn't really touch the idea until he passed in November 2016. And when he passed, I thought perhaps I can resurrect this idea. And so I, I kind of just began and, and, and let the process take me wherever it led me. So when you quote him in the book, are those quotes from other sources that you have looked into as opposed to firsthand interviews with you? Yes, they are. All, all of the Leonard quotes are from other sources um, uh, and for which I've sought and received permission to, for their use, yes. Now you did mention 500 interviews. Michael, I think the official expression or the technical term for that is, oy vey, Michael, 500 interviews. Why so many? Well, I, I, in the nature of these things, one thing would lead to another. You know, you would you would interview uh, somebody and they would say, you know, really, you should talk to so-and-so. And then so-and-so would say, you should talk to so-and-so and so-and-so. And so so the numbers kept accumulating and, and the material was to me at least, was interesting. I was getting new stories and new insights. And so I just thought, uh, let's just keep going. And and truthfully, I think, you know, if if time were not a, a limitation, you could probably get to a thousand with Leonard. Remember that he's a guy who lived in so many different worlds, the, the music world, the literary world, the Zen world, the Jewish world, before we even get to his romantic life. So, so he touched a lot of lives directly, um, apart from his music and poetry. And so, um, I don't know, you, you kind of get a hunger for these stories and you just keep going. Now, of course, many of his colleagues and contemporaries would be in their 80s and even older now. And how much pressure did you feel to get this done quickly so that those sources are still here? Well, I felt a lot of pressure, in fact. Um, and as it happens, sadly, a, a dozen people a dozen people who I interviewed uh, during the process have passed uh, during these past four years. So, so there is some pressure, um, especially with that with that demographic, with that age group. So, yes, I absolutely felt that. Now, some would not be feeling that demographic pressure, such as his kids. Did you manage to get them involved? I did not. I did not get the uh, the support uh, of of the kids or the estate, and to some extent. I completely understand. I mean, uh, his his relationship with his children was long, long and complicated, and and probably deserves a book by itself that perhaps one or both of them will write one day. Um, so I, I almost never expected to get the children. There were people that I I wished I had gotten that I didn't, including his best childhood friend Morton Rosengarten, Canadian sculptor, a wonderful guy. Um, I think if Leonard had been alive and had been able to formally give his blessing to this project, uh, Morton would have talked to me and others. But you know, you're you, you're not going to get everybody. You know, Steve, I don't want to pretend that it's it's absolutely a definitive biography. It's not, but I think it. My hope is that it, it will add to the conversation about Leonard Cohen. Oh, it surely does that. In fact, I mean, I can tell you, I did not know that Leonard Cohen's mother secretly wanted to sleep with Irving Layton. I mean, that's that's a <laughs> nugget I did not know before I read the book. <laughs> well, th there is some speculation in that comment, which comes from a, come up, comes from uh, Leonard's from sorry from Irving's ex partner Aviva Layton, but but it's certainly plausible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one of the things that maybe um, <laughs> less prurient things that jumps out of the book is that this guy was constantly on the move, right? He was always, always, always on the move. Why do you think? 
You know, I think there's a few factors. Um, uh, one, one is simply his his uh, a sense of wanderlust, uh, a sense of never being comfortable for too long in one place, and and indeed, as soon as he became comfortable, uh, he became uncomfortable in a sense, and so he moved on. And so you see this pattern repeatedly, where he's moving around between Montreal and New York and Los Angeles and London and Paris and Hydra, the island of Hydra in Greece. And, and and he just, you know, he's a week here, two weeks there, three days here, and then he moves on. The other factor, perhaps, is that he was hugely influenced by Irving Layton, who taught him, among other things, to really drink life to the lees, as Tennyson said, to really soak up experience. And 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 I think he, you know, he was an adventurous guy. He, he goes to uh, Ethiopia in 1973, uh, when they're about to embark on civil war, he goes to Cuba in 1961, uh, just before the Bay of Pigs. He's 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 fearless in a way, and and he wants adventure, and and he wants, you know, he wants to live life, and so uh, and expose himself to the to the entire range of human experience. And yet, unlike Frank Sinatra, who always said when he got out of Hackensack, New Jersey, I never want to go back there ever, Montreal always called him home. Why do you think? Well, it was home. Uh, his family was there still, the, the extended Cohen family. His, his good friends were there. Um, um, it, it, it was the source. It was, it was his upbringing, you know. Uh, he was deeply connected to it. He always maintained a house there. Um, even when he was living most of the time in L.A., he would make time to come back to Montreal virtually every year for, for you know, a week or two or a month or whatever it was. So uh, he, had, he had deep roots there. And, and deep friendships, and, and, he, and he wanted to maintain those. There is a duality about Montreal, though, beyond, obviously, English and French. There's modern and more traditional. Uh, there is religious and secular. Um, how at ease was he with all of these different aspects of Montreal, in your view? Oh, I think he was entirely at ease. I mean, he did, he did write early on about the, the weight of history upon his shoulders, his sense that he wasn't able to express anything new um, because of that weight that all of history had already been written in the in the in the streets, the pavement, and the stones of Montreal. Um, uh, that's an interesting idea, and and it it did lead in part, I think, to him for him to break away from the more traditional uh, formats of poetry that he studied in, in university and to become a more modernist poet. Um, but I think he was comfortable with that. He, you know, remember that he is a minority as a, as a Jew in Westmount in Montreal. He is he was a representative of a minority of a minority, and 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 I think that may have lent him a, a unique perspective on everything that was happening around him. Well, ha having said that, he did not exactly grow up as. Um you know, the ragman's son, if I can put it that way. He, I mean, this guy grew up in Westmount, and, and uh, you know, he was as waspy a Jew as they come, I guess, right? I don't know if I'd use the word waspy a Jew. He was an affluent Jew, for sure. The okay. family was was royalty in, in Montreal. Um, but, you know, in adulthood, once he once he was on his own, uh, even when he was making lots of money, he, he basically gave it away. He didn't spend it on himself. He would spend it to fly to to Greece or fly to Rome or fly to Paris, but but he he never accumulated uh, expensive art, expensive automobiles. In fact, the the walls of all his homes were essentially bare. People would give him art, and he would put it in the closet. He 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 had really very little interest in in materialism, hmm. um, and so um, it is true that he came from privilege. But even in his heyday, you know, he would travel with two, two when he was on tour, he would travel with two suits of clothes and and uh, and he would wash one one night and wear the other in the concert and then do the same thing the next day so he, he was he, he did not live a large life in as the saying goes and we do have to remember he lost his father at a very young age as well which no doubt had a traumatic impact on him huge impact I think that you know that's incalculable um, and and bears further investigation I think by other historians and biographers going forward. Right. Well, let us talk about some of the people um, with whom he has connected over the years, and some of these stories are really terrific. Uh, certainly the names Suzanne and Marianne will be familiar to those uh, who know Leonard Cohen's work, uh, Suzanne and So Long Marianne being the songs that came out of those relationships, but quite a few of his songs. And let's talk about Take This Longing, or Joan of Arc, or One of Us Cannot Be Wrong, apparently inspired by the singer Nico. 
And let's start there. What was their relationship like? Uh, well, um, in the case, in that case, it's it's unrequited love. Um, Leonard was when he met her in, in the late 1960s in New York, in the in the Andy Warhol scene, he was entirely smitten by her, and and as he did with women he was interested in, he pursued her relentlessly. Um, she rejected him. She told him she wasn't interested in older men. She was interested in younger men, and and. And, you know, so she spurned him, but they did manage to establish a kind of friendship, a modus vivendi, uh, and she did inspire these songs. He was he was completely taken with her. Judy Collins and Leonard Cohen had a great relationship, a very collaborative uh, professional relationship as well. Tell us a bit about that. So uh, Judy Collins is a huge figure in the career of Leonard Cohen because she hears Suzanne and a few of his other songs sometime in early 1966, and she's in the middle of recording an album of her own and needs more, more cuts, more tracks. And she says, I love this song. I'm, I'm going to record it. So she records Suzanne, and it becomes, because of Judy Collins being at the time far better known than Leonard Cohen, it, it, it gains notoriety and, and circulation and radio play and basically puts him on the map. Um, and then she brings him to various concerts where she's performing and gives him, uh, you know, billing and, and, and lets him perform and essentially introduces him to her, her folk world. Um, she's a huge figure. Um, and, and I guess perhaps uh, he repaid that kindness to some extent by encouraging her to write, to write her own songs and not just do covers. Mm -hmm. Any sense uh, that you picked up along the way that he might have been, oh, I don't know, not 100% on board with writing songs that made other people stars as opposed to recording them himself at the beginning and becoming a star like they were? You know, I think he was always his own man and he was always doing his own thing. He, he you know, he, he looked for inspiration in various places. I know that um, uh, Joni Mitchell would later accuse him of of plagiarism, um, and and there's no doubt that he would he would go through the works of of other poets and other and other lyricists to find inspiration. But he would find a way to make them his own, and he was constantly reinventing himself. He was a guy, you know, you listen from album to album, and they are very seldom uh, a continuation of what he was doing. They are usually a departure. And, and it was a way for him to try and reinvent himself and stay fresh and, and really stay true to what he was. Well, since you mentioned Joni Mitchell and that charge of plagiarism, we should follow up on that right now. And let me just say a word to our director, Sheldon Osmond. Uh, top of page four, Sheldon, let's bring up this quote here. This is what Joni Mitchell said of her, <laughs> of her good friend Leonard Cohen. I briefly liked Leonard Cohen, though once I read Camus and Lorca, I started to realize that he had taken a lot of lines from those books, which was disappointing to me. Now, that's quite an allegation to make. Uh, how did he take that? I don't think he took it particularly well. On the other hand, they did maintain a friendship long after that. Um, they would see each other, you know, periodically in Los Angeles or New York or even in Toronto. And, and, um, and so uh, I'm sure he didn't like that comment. Um, but I don't think he literally was guilty of plagiarism, frankly. I think he, he used Lorca and he used Camus and he used others as I say, for inspiration, but um, but he wasn't stealing. The Joni and Mitchell. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, you just may remember the. I think it's T. S. Eliot who who is credited with the line, um, "Good writers borrow and great writers steal." <laughs> That's a great line. The the Joni Mitchell song, "A Case of You," is that about Leonard? Uh, almost certainly. And and his almost mother certainly. basically confirmed that, didn't she? She basic well. She's in. She's in the song. Yeah. Uh, or if she's not in that song, she's in one of the other songs, and where, where she basically tells Joni, "Go with him if you must, but be prepared to bleed." <laughs> Stay with him if you can, but be prepared to bleed. That's the lyric. Yeah, exactly that's, right. That's the line. Thank you. Thank right you. Right on. Well, there's another moment in Leonard Cohen's life where he is honored with the Governor General's Award for Poetry. This is for his 1968 book, Leonard Cohen's Selected Poems, 1956 to 68, and. He essentially tells the Governor General's people, not interested. Here's the telegram he sent. May I respectfully request that my name be withdrawn from the list of recipients of the Governor General's Award for 1968. Much in me strives for this honor, but the poems themselves forbid it absolutely. Now, that's one explanation that has been given. There's a meeting with Mordecai Richler in a bathroom 
that may offer another explanation. You want to lay that one on us? Well, as I understand it, Mordecai was deeply offended by by Cohn's decision to reject this award. He thought this is this is despicable. This is, you don't behave like this in Canada. Somebody honors you in this way, you you graciously accept. And and so, uh, as the story goes, Mordecai was prepared to confront him and uh, and, and did confront him in in the washroom, and and said, "How is it possible that you could reject this this award?" And and Cohn said to him, "I don't really know." And, and and then for some reason Mordecai thought that was a perfect response and and didn't punch him in the nose. <laughs> okay, you write in the epilogue of the book, his timber was mediocre at best, his vocal range was limited, his guitar skills were marginal, yet there was clearly something in his voice and lyrics that resonated that penetrated to the very heart of his audiences. I well remember Michael as you do I'm sure when he got um, male vocalist of the year. And, and, and he got up on stage and basically said, only in a country like Canada could someone with a voice like mine be considered the best vocalist of the year. But he did connect. How come? You know, I, I, you know he has a famous, uh, a famous song called um, The Singer Must Die. And, and the singer must die for the lie in his voice is, is the lyric. And I think what Cohn means, and of course this is subject to interpretation, but my reading of it would be that there's something to be gained by authenticity and genuineness. He didn't have a great voice uh, as measured by conventional standards, but he had an honest voice and he conveyed the honesty of his lyric um, every night, night after night, with sincerity and with passion and with conviction and, and audiences responded to that honesty. He, his lyric was able to touch human hearts in a way that many other lyricists and composers cannot do. And, um, and so I think for that reason, um, his music resonated with audiences around the world, literally around the world. That's well said. I know that uh, Neil Young used to say the same thing. He knew that he didn't have what would classically be considered a good voice, but, he's, but he would say, it's my voice, it's authentically me. And that yes. kind of thing, it does connect, doesn't it? Precisely, that's precisely the point. It's, it's, it's the honesty in the voice. Hmm. Now, by the time we, we, you mentioned earlier that his business manager really took him to the cleaners, did he, after doing that world tour, and and you know, was he able to get his finances in better shape and and get himself back into the black eventually? As I understand it, yes, and then some. Uh, in, in fact, yes, and then a lot. Um, he made many millions of dollars on the, in those last five years touring the world, um, and 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 beyond the money. Uh, achieved a stature and a status uh, in the music world that had heretofore uh, eluded him. He, you know, uh, for many, many years, Leonard had an enormous following in, in Europe, uh, a strong following in Canada, but, but was virtually nowhere registered in the United State, States except out, out, you know, except in Los Angeles and New York and a few other cities. And, and this world tour really you know, really put him on the map internationally. Well, as you're considering your, if, if I can mix a metaphor here, your, your Mount Rushmore of songwriters, uh, Bob Dylan, Gordon Lightfoot, uh, Carol King, Joni Mitchell, Paul, Paul Simon. Paul Simon. Yeah. Is he up there with all of them? Oh, unquestionably. Unqu mm. I mean, there, there is a huge debate in the, in the Conian world about whether Bob Dylan really deserved the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, in 2016 and that it should have gone to Leonard Cohen. And that debate will rage on, of course. Um, oh, absolutely. He's, he's, he's living in the pentos. Hmm. Penthouse. I'd like to know how much of a fan of his you were before you embarked on this project and whether you are more or less of a fan now. I'm more of a fan. Uh, I don't know how much I was. Of, I, I was a fan of his music before, but I, to be quite candid, I, I, I don't know that I, I knew it that well. Um, I know it much better, of course, at this point, and I've become a, a, a much uh, stronger fan, I guess, if that's the phrase. Um, um, I, you know, I think he's a cultural giant. I, I can't, you know, I, you, you put up earlier the, uh, the poster image that uh, is draped across nine stories of a building in Montreal. Who else can you think of anywhere in the world who has a nine-story mural on a wall dedicated to them? It's... He's, he's an enormous 
global figure, that, and his work will last for a very long time. Now, as we suggested in the intro uh, 20 or so odd minutes ago, this is the first of three that you're going to do. And, and you haven't exactly held back here. I mean, this book's 480 pages or so. So you've got, two, you, you've got this and two more to go. When are we going to see those, do you think? In a perfect world, <laughs> which, we don't which we don't live in, <laughs> in a perfect world, it, the next one will, will land sometime next fall, and the third one would land a year after that. Um, they're, they're well advanced in terms of, of production, but not yet complete. I'm still hoping to get some important personalities that have so far escaped me. Uh, you want to name names? Um, sure. Um, Rebecca De Mornay, Dominique Easterman, uh, the mother of Leonard's children. You know, I may or may not succeed. I don't know. I'm trying. How many years between him and Rebecca De Mornay? I mean, it's got to oh, be 30? It's close. Yeah. It's close. And yet it was a great love affair, wasn't it? In its day, it was. In its day, yeah. Let's finish up on this, Michael. I wonder how sad you are about the fact that he's not around to read this book. Yeah, you know, I, it's a good question. Um, I, I am sad because I think he would like it. I think, you know, I often say that this is the uh, the Rashomon of Leonard Cohen, you know, the Japanese film by uh, Kurosawa, yeah. which, which is a film that looks at the same storyline from various points of view. And I think Leonard, at some level, would relate to what I've tried to do here, which is to capture his complexity and multiplicity um, from various points of view. And, and, and he would like that, the ambiguity that, that results, where people are often contradicting each other about what exactly happened or what the meaning of what exactly happened was. Great. Good luck with parts two and three. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Not at all. In the meantime, we're happy to recommend Leonard Cohen, Untold Stories, The Early Years, by Michael Posner. Michael, it's good to see you again. You be well, okay? You too. Thank you, Steve. And that is the agenda for Monday, December 14th, 2020. As the federal government makes its biggest move yet on the climate file, tomorrow we'll assess the risks facing Canada's forests and oceans. Also, we'll get a new take on the history of the Hudson's Bay Company. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.